Hey, Joe, thanks so much for joining the show today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. To get started here, can you tell the audience a little bit about your background in, in UX design? So I started out in the field of graphic design. I went to school for graphic design back yep. in the 80s. <laughs> started my career in the, in the late uh, 80s, which feels like a million years ago, pre-internet, right? Wow. Pre-websites, pre-everything. When the web came along, I essentially couldn't convince the guys who ran the ad agency I worked at that this internet thing wasn't a passing fad. They were like, nah, no one's going to care about that. Clients don't care. Go make me a cup of coffee. So I um, was arrogant enough or naive enough or brave enough or whatever adjective you want to use to say, fine, I'm going to start my own company and we're going to do web design or you know whatever. We had no idea what that was, by the way. Right. Um, so we just sort of dove into it. And like most companies at that time and independent uh, freelancers at that time, we learned by doing. We said yes to everything <laughs> and we learned on the fly. And it was a really cool time to, to get into something. So for me, all the rules I learned about how you design something for somebody, how you make it appropriate and valuable and useful to someone on the receiving end of it, applied directly to website design. It applied directly to software design um, when software as a service came about. To me, the same principles, same rules applied directly to that. The research part, the knowing your users part, to me, it was all the same thing. So then, of course, I encountered the work of Alan Cooper, um, Don Norman, uh, Steve Krug, Dan Brown. There's a million names, yeah. right? Who just a succession of things that made my head explode, right? And the more I was exposed to, the more I loved it. And um, so that was it. I got... I. Got a lot of client work really fast. I got very was very fortunate to be doing it at that time. I grew that company to six employees. I sold it to an IT firm, hung out with them for a couple of years, remembered why I didn't want to work for anybody else, went back to independent consulting and started sort of getting into teaching online in addition to consulting with clients. At this point, I still consult with clients uh, on a regular basis, on an ongoing basis. I do a lot of speaking gigs. I've written a couple of books. I've got two more on the way this year. Uh, and at this point online, we have over 200,000 students. It's, it's somewhere around 270,000 at this point. Oh, that's awesome. And, and congrats on, on all of that. That sounds exciting. So, so, I mean, that makes me wonder, like you probably see some interesting trends among students going into their first uh, design sure. job. What, what are you seeing in, in terms of that? Well, I think the one thing that hasn't changed Okay, for young designers in particular, young UXers in particular entering the field, is that their educations don't really accurately prepare them for what they encounter at the point where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Yep. There's, a, there's a massive gap between theory and practice in education of all kinds, uh, yep. unfortunately. And I include boot camps in that group. All right, this is not to like bash on boot camps, but a lot of it is very theoretical. It's all perfect world. It's very ordered and structured. And there are all these diagrams and processes. And, and you know, this is the way you do this. And you read the stuff and it sounds great and you get excited. And then you get into a situation where you have people and personalities and emotions and politics yep. and, and money. All right. And, and it changes all that. Yeah. And, and I think if you're not prepared for that, a lot of it is very difficult to reconcile. And I think in some cases you wind up saying yes to things that had you known differently, you may not have agreed to. Right. You can be sold the, the vision of we have the best, best UX team and yeah. we're, we're extremely mature in terms of UX maturity. And then the reality can be very different. So what do you, how do you reconcile with that? I mean, do you just quit your job and, and run away from UX? <laughs> what's, the, what's the solution? You have to get in the habit of, of asking better questions all right, in, in an interview process. One thing that everybody forgets, and I give this advice at least three times a week <laughs> in one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions and as loudly as I can to anyone across social media who will listen to it, you have to remember that you are interviewing them. They have to be a fit for you. And unfortunately, reality dictates that you have to make sure that they're not sort of selling you a bill of goods that isn't necessarily there also. So you have to come in prepared with questions. How does work move through this organization? 
Who approves it? Who has final say? How do people work together? I think that's great advice for, for people looking and wondering, hey, is this organization actually doing what they preach? But what about for those people that maybe are in an organization that maybe they feel like, and I think this is typical for any org, like no one, it's not utopia in terms of their of course security not. For, for UX, but how can a, a, maybe a junior mid-level or even senior level designer help you know uh, solidify UX and grow that organizational maturity? I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> and really, I am. And the reason is, um, not only am I writing a book around this topic, uh, oh, nice. but, but the recent talk at, uh, coming up at, at UX Live is around the very same topic. And it is around the idea of taking your power back, so to speak. Not in a forceful, confrontational way, okay, as that probably sounds. But I think that entry-level and mid-level and junior-level folks have mm -hmm. a lot more power uh, an ability to affect change <laughs> than they think, right? And, and that starts with being heard. And the way you are heard is when you start talking about things that are also on the minds of those people in other roles. So designers, for instance, uh, and UXers need to learn how to speak business. When you connect that to I understand from the last quarterly meeting that we had that the impetus is we need to get our costs down by 30% in four weeks, <laughs> right? Because the quarter's coming to a close. I think that we could accomplish that if we implemented this, 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 and this in the self-service area of this app, right? And if we were put clear instructions around these two parts, which people seem to be struggling with, mm -hmm. I think that would cut down on some of these calls that come into uh, the support desk or the online chat or whatever it is. That's a conversation that number one, nobody expects you to come out of the gate with. And number two, it's a conversation that suggests that you're paying attention to the things that they care about. You have to tailor your efforts to that goal. It is the most important thing on the docket right now. Absolutely. That's how you get heard. That's how people see you as more than just the designer especially after they see a result. If you do that thing you proposed and it gets the result or gets close to those results, now the next time something comes along, you'd be surprised. Somebody's going to send you an email. Hey, can you sit in with us for 20 minutes while we talk about this? I mean, I've seen this play out over and over and over and over again, right? So again, you have more power than you think. You have the ability to join those conversations. And if you're not being invited to them, you need to find a way to invite yourself to them. Joe, something I keep seeing um, from, from even applicants to our business is a supposedly mature design org um, at a company that, you know, many of us look up to for, for their design systems and things like that is actually asking that employee after two years of being remote to come back to the office and maybe move cities or commute again, where I don't necessarily think, or I, I mean, it's evident from people applying that it's not something they're interested in doing. What, what advice do you have for someone who may be interested in an org who's talking about going back to the office and, and they've become accustomed to working remote like so many of us have? I, I think it's, I honestly believe that it is your decision to make. I, I believe that the power is very much in your hands and you have to keep it that way. If you do not want to move, okay? And if you do not want to sit in an office again, which for a lot of people is still a very scary proposition, yeah. which I totally understand. I had COVID in 2020, it sent me to the hospital. I think you have every right to say, look, quite honestly, that's, that's a non-starter for me. If, if it's, again, if it's a place you already work, you point to experience so far. I don't think my job performance has lagged in any way. There's nothing, there's no ball that has been dropped. There's nothing that hasn't been taken care of. Um, no one has ever had to remind me <laughs> to show up or to do the work or any of those things. Um, and quite frankly, I feel a lot safer for myself. If you have a family, for my family, um, I think that this is, the, this is a choice I have to make for me. I understand if you can't accommodate that, mm -hmm. but I have to, I sort of have to stand firm on this. It's, it's a condition. I think you have every right to do that. I also think you have every right to do that as an applicant. State, I completely understand if you can't accommodate this, but it's necessary for me. Yeah. That's it. And then you'll learn how much I care about your. That's right. 
and personal space and work life balance and those things that you know you probably want to work somewhere where they do respect those well well that's I right I think any place that any place that, that says no to that, if it isn't now, it's going to be a place where you don't want to work. Totally agree. Well, Joe, what, how can people find you for, for that one-on-one consulting and coaching? Because obviously, hmm. great advice here. Yeah. If you go to um, givegoodux.com slash coaching, you'll see the rundown of what I do and how I do it. Um, and there's a little form there to fill out if you're interested. You don't have to like sign up and pay. It's just a you know, you tell me what you're looking for and, and we'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, I just, I literally just opened that up because my schedule up until this point just wouldn't allow it, but I've decided I want to, I really want to make time for it because it's something I like doing. So yeah, anyone can work one-on-one with me. You'll always find me on Twitter. Always. <laughs> Even when I probably shouldn't be. Um, GiveGoodUX.com is my website. All my courses uh, and training videos, which we, we push out a new, a book or, or a video or a course every month. Wow. Um, at the UX 365 Academy, that is it at uh, learn.givegoodux.com. That's where all the courses are. And uh, like I said, social media, I've got, I'm doing UX live uh, in London. I've got a couple of the virtual conferences coming up. Um, books on the way. I don't know how to say no to anything, basically, including my own stuff. <laughs> yeah, sounds busy. Sounds busy. Thanks for coming on the show and, and telling everyone how they can connect with you. Sure. I, I appreciate you having me. And uh, as anyone on social media knows, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about just about anything if time permits. Feel free to uh, hit me up at the question. Love it. 